السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح حي على الفلاح الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته وَلَا تَمُوتُنَّ إِلَّا وَأَنْتُمْ مُسْلِمُونَ O Muslims, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has reminded us in the Qur'an to be conscious of him when he says, O you who believe, fear Allah as he deserves to be feared and do not die except in a state of submission to him. Dear Muslim, this month marks two years of when this COVID pandemic began. Two years have gone by. It was this very month and this very week where News began to spread, and within a few days, our masjid had to shut down. And in these last two years, every single one of us, without exception, has been affected. We have suffered various types of trauma. Some of us have lost loved ones. All of us have lost friends. Financially, there has been suffering as well. And it is during times like this where our iman is tested, and where we have to renew our commitment to the ideals of our faith. And one of the most beautiful stories of the Qur'an 
that reiterates the wisdoms of why there's so much difficulty in this world is the story that we should read every single Friday that is mentioned in Surah Al-Kahf. And in today's brief khutbah, I'm going to remind myself and you of a story that we have probably heard many times, but especially in light of difficulty, in light of tragedy, in light of loss, this story takes on new meaning. And every single time I come back to this story and read it, I find something beneficial, or I'm reminded of something that I had lost track of simply because, as Allah says, وَذَكِّرْ فَإِنَّ الذِّكْرَى تَنْفَعُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Keep on reminding, because reminding benefits the believers. And this is the story of Khidr and Musa alayhi salam, and the three incidents that took place, each one of which involves pain and suffering and trauma and loss. And through navigating these stories, we find comfort and we find relevancy in our, in, in our own pains and tragedies. Allah tells us in the Quran, and in fact the Prophet ﷺ gave a very detailed hadith that explains it, and in today's khutbah I'll mix the two together, that once Musa salam stood up and he gave a khutbah, a lecture, and it moved the people so much that one of the people of Bani Israel said, O oh Musa, you are the most knowledgeable person on earth, right? There's nobody more knowledgeable than you. He was so impressed with the khutbah of Musa, the lecture of Musa, that he said, you are the most knowledgeable, right? And Musa alayhi salam, not knowing who could be more knowledgeable than him, made an assumption. And he said, yes, I am the most knowledgeable person on earth. And it was an assumption because he's a prophet. And he has in his own mind the justification to make that assumption. Immediately Jibreel came down and said to Musa, how could you say something without knowledge? Indeed, there is somebody else on earth that Allah has given knowledge that you do not have. And you should not have said you are the most knowledgeable. Musa alayhi salam immediately asked forgiveness and then asked Allah permission to go travel to study with this person of knowledge. This is what you call humility. Nobody on earth is all knowledgeable of everything. Allah is al alim. Allah says, وَفَوْقَ كُلِّ ذِي عِلْمٍ عَلِيمٍ Every one of us who has knowledge, there's somebody who has more knowledge than you. You might be an expert in one field, but you cannot be an expert in all fields. And even the prophets, each one has knowledge the other does not have. So Musa alayhi salam asked permission, let me go travel. And our scholars say this was the first time somebody traveled for the sake of knowledge. Knowledge is attained via traveling and studying. Knowledge is attained one-on-one, -on -one, not just from the books. Books are secondary. With knowledge also comes musahaba, being with the teacher, seeing the spiritual reality of the teacher. And so Musa alayhi salam requests permission, let me go and study with this person, ya Allah. So Allah says, okay, I give you permission. Musa says, how will I find him? Allah says, go until where the rivers meet. Some say where uh, the two streams of the Red Sea, others have other interpretations, where the two streams or the two seas meet. And take with you a fish. Where that fish disappears, you will find that person. So Musa and his fata, his, his, uh, his, uh, not his son, but his servant, Yusha ibn Nun, they started traveling. And they went far and wide. And they had that sign of the fish with them. Then one time they went to sleep and the fish miraculously disappeared. Yusha forgot to tell Musa. They continued onwards. Then Musa said, give me my dinner. I'm very tired. I have, we haven't found this guy. Yusha then said, remember when we stopped at that place? I forgot to tell you that the fish miraculously disappeared. That was the place. They returned back all the way here. Our scholars say of the wisdoms is that Allah is testing Musa and his patience. Knowledge is never gained except via patience, except via multiple paths and you have to cross those paths. So Allah is testing Musa and Musa did not get frustrated with Yusha. He said it's an honest mistake. They went back all the way to that place and there they found a person that all around him was green and this is why he is called called Khidr or Khadr. Our Prophet ﷺ told us this. The reason why he's called Khadr, it's a name, not a, it's, a, it's an adjective, not a proper name. His actual name we do not know. But he is called Al Khadr because wherever he would go, the earth would become green with vegetation. And so his laqab or his title was Khadr or Khidr. And they found this man sitting there. And Musa says to him, Assalamu alaikum. Khadr says, how do you know Salam in this land where there are no other Muslims? 
Musa says, I am Musa of the people of Bani Israel. Khadr says, oh, you are that Musa. Wa alaykum as -salam. Notice, Khadr knew of Musa. He didn't recognize Musa. And Musa did not know Khadr until Allah told him who Khadr was. Automatically we see Khadr has some knowledge Musa does not have. Because Khadr understood, oh you are Musa of the Bani Israel. And he knew who he was, but he did not recognize him. This also shows us that Khadr was not an angel, or else he would have recognized Musa. This also shows us, and we're going to learn as well, that Khadr was a prophet of Allah. This is the correct opinion. Some say he was a righteous saint, but in reality he was a prophet. Because Khadr says to Musa that I have knowledge that Allah has given me that he has not given you. And you have knowledge that Allah has given you, he has not given me. When Khadr is saying, I have knowledge that Allah has given me, automatically this makes him a prophet. When Allah gives you knowledge directly, This is al-ilm al-laduni, al-ilm from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Khadr is saying, I have knowledge, you do not have. And you have knowledge, I do not have. This indicates that Khadr is indeed a prophet. Musa says, let me travel with you. Now again, the whole story is beyond the khutbah, uh, the details, we can go over verse by verse. But the three main stories that we need to emphasize. Number one, the first story, of course, Khadr puts the condition. If you want to come with me, I have one condition. You cannot speak to me. You cannot ask me for explanation until I tell you. You have to trust me. And Khadr denies or negates that you wouldn't be able to be patient, Ya Musa. You wouldn't understand what I'm going to do. And this shows us, by the way, one of the benefits of knowledge is tolerance. Wallahi, we see this fanaticism only comes when you don't have knowledge. Hardcore opinions come, impatience come when you don't have knowledge. So Khidr, who had some knowledge that Musa did not, Khadr or Khidr says to Musa, إِنَّكَ لَن تَسْتَطِيعَ مَعَيَ sabara." Because when you don't have ilm, or you think you have ilm, or for your ilm is only just one, perspective or one opinion the minute you hear another opinion you lose your patience this is not true it cannot be correct but when you have ilm you become more open-minded you understand you become more tolerant so Khidr says to Musa you're not going to be able to understand you're going to be impatient you don't have the types of knowledge I do and Musa says no no I want to learn I'm going to learn and so three incidents happen each one of them Musa loses his patience the first one as you're aware they don't have any money these are the prophets of Allah and they don't have money in their pockets but they need to go on a ship so when they're going on a ship they ask who can take them and the one ship that is willing to take them is the poorest ship they are the most generous which is another irony generally speaking the poor are more generous than the rich in terms of their heart generally speaking the more people have the more stingy you become and Allah says in the Quran if you had the treasures of all the heavens and earth you would become extremely miserly this is what Allah is saying in the Quran so the poor masakin gave them a free ride. None of the rich ships gave them a free ride. The poor Masakin said, Yalla, no problem, come with us, we'll take you across the ocean. And so Musa and Khadr went on their ship. When the fishermen are on top, Khadr comes, takes an axe or takes a metal rod and he cracks a hole in. The, the fishermen don't know what's happening. The boat is about to sink. They go back to the shore before they can discover Khadr and Musa get off the boat and Musa loses his patience. These were poor people. They were generous. Why would you destroy their ship? Why would you do that? Khadr says, I told you, you can't be patient. Musa says, you're right. I forgot. I'm not going to do it again. Hardly has this conversation finished when they come across a ghulam, a child playing on the beach, on the, on the, on the sand, on the shore. And right then and there, فَقَتَلَهُ He executes. And this clearly shows this is not a, a wali or a saint. This is a prophet of Allah. No one has the right to do this unless Allah commands them. No one has the right to do something like this unless it is a Nabi who has an explicit command from Allah and that's something you cannot make analogy or qiyas on. So he does this deed. Musa has not forgotten the, con the, the contract or the condition. But what has happened now is beyond. You cannot remain quiet. He says, how dare you kill an innocent child? How could you do this? And Khadr says, look, I told you, didn't I? I told you, you will not be patient. And Musa understood that, yes, this was another test. So now he put a condition on himself. And Musa says, okay, you know what? Three strikes and I'm out. One more time and I'm not going to uh, accompany you. We're going to part our ways. You have one. I'm not going to be able to be patient with you. Then they're traveling. They're hungry. Again, no food. And they pass by the city. And as you're all aware, 
in those times and in that civilizations, all civilizations, when you are hungry and thirsty and you pass by a city, it is the haq or the right of humanity that you give a glass of water, you give a small piece of bread. It's the haq of humanity. All people do this. It's the way of the world. When a traveler goes into your city, has nothing else, you just give him just from the well, go and get some water. However, in this particular city, in this particular village, they were so stingy, they didn't even give them that glass of water. They didn't even give them some water from the well. Still, when they were expelled and they were mocked and they were made fun of and they're walking out the city, Khadr builds the part of the wall that was there. And Musa is tired, frustrated, angry, hungry. He says, the least you could have done, they didn't give us food and water. Get some money for your, for your uh, effort so that we can buy some food and water. And Khadr fulfills his condition that Musa put from now on, we're going to part our ways, and now let me explain. And in this explanation, brothers and sisters, in this explanation, every time a tragedy happens to one of us, we should read this surah again. Every time a calamity, because the first calamity is the loss of money, is the loss of a possession or belonging. The second calamity is the loss of life, it's the loss of someone you love. The third calamity, it is the prolonging of suffering. You're in pain, you're in suffering, and there's no end in sight. And every one of these calamities, we face them regularly. The first calamity, the loss of something that you own, your material possession. In this particular case, the fuqara, this ship, this dhow, this dinghy, it was owned by a multiple of people, not even one. They're so poor, they can't even afford one fishing boat. So five or ten people have come together, pooled their resources, and purchased a fishing boat. The rest of the city is wealthy. This is the poorest lot. And Khadir says, you don't know. Allah told me that a king is going to come and going to confiscate all of the ships for his navy. And this ship that it has a hole in it, the king doesn't have the patience to repair it. He's going to leave that ship and take all the rest of the ships in the harbor such that when the king leaves, the only ship left in the entire village will be this fisherman's ship. So from being the poorest of the poor, they become literally multimillionaires because they have the only ship in the entire village. You don't know by putting this one hole, I saved them from a much larger calamity. And I swear to you brothers and sisters, how many stories I have experienced and my close friends and colleagues and people that have told me that some tragedy happened and they're wondering why did this happen it caused them inconvenience only to discover that tragedy was wallahi a blessing in disguise in one particular case uh, uh, there was a minor uh, uh, car accident where the the tire was was broken the, the car had to move out of the way and people are frustrated and Hajj and Umrah what's going on hours are delayed turns out that had they been on the road there was actually a major oil spill and a much worse disaster that might even have cost their lives by saving the car but with one tire flat they, they, they were wasting an hour their lives were saved had they been on the road Allah knows what would have happened if they had been going and that major accident took place Allah saved them by just putting a tire puncture saved the entire car and there are so many other stories that I have witnessed and I have seen and no tragedy happens except that we put our trust in Allah that what Allah has saved us from is more than what this tragedy has cost us. There has to be a sense of Iman and Tawakkul. It also shows us, by the way, this story, that the way to save yourselves from calamities is generosity. Why did Allah save the ship of these fishermen? Why did Allah choose this ship to save? Because they were the most generous. They were the ones who, even though they didn't have money, they were willing to give from their ship, allow the people to come on their boat for free. This shows us when you're good unto others, when you're kind unto others, when you're generous unto others, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will protect you. Don't be stingy from Allah's blessings, thinking that holding it in your hand is going to bring Allah's blessings. When you give to others, Allah azza wa will give you back much more. So we learn from this story that when a tragedy happens, one of the best ways to save yourselves is you be a benefit to other people. And when that happens, console yourself that what Allah has saved me from is much more. We might lose a job, we might lose an income, we might be in some minor accident, Whatever happens, put your tawakkul and trust that the bigger picture is something I don't understand, but Allah knows and I don't know. As for the second, which is indeed a very 
traumatic story and especially in light of the last two three weeks where incidents around the globe of innocent children you know having very difficult deaths in Morocco and Afghanistan and other places these types of things that happen and it's times like this where we all wonder why what's going on people who don't have faith begin to question the wisdom of God or even the existence of God and we remind ourselves of this story we remind ourselves of this story that Allah has a wisdom and indeed nobody can understand the suffering of a parent who has lost a son or daughter except another parent it is a tragedy that I ask Allah to protect myself and yourself from there is no tragedy it is said that is more painful than that tragedy Allahumma accept one and that is you know if a young child passes away wallahi it is a suffering and pain not meant to trivialize at all but the memory of a beautiful child is gonna be forever and inshallah you'll be reunited with a child in Jannah but worse than this is a child that grows up to be an obstinate young man who is rude and rejecting of his parents who will constantly cause tension who will constantly bring distress and grief and shame that is a worse pain than the pain of an innocent child that is gone and whose memory remains pure so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in this surah that Allah knew that this child would cause them pain this child would give them grief throughout their lives and because they were good Allah wanted to give them a beautiful child this was not the child that was right for them so Allah blessed them with five ten years of a beautiful child took the child away memories remain Jannah is there then Allah will substitute a better child for them we learn from this so many things of them obviously the most simple one is that life and death is in the hands of Allah it's not in our hands when death occurs we have to have an acceptance inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. we also accept that when death occurs it was the best for that person we don't know when death is best we don't know but Allah knows and Allah will choose the death that is the best for the righteous person whether it's a child whether it's a 50 year old whether it's a 90 year old Allah knows best when is the best time to take that person's soul so we accept Allah's Qadr yes we can be sad yes we can grieve but deep down inside there must be an acceptance that Allah knows the best time I'm not the one who knows the future Allah knows the future so we accept this as well another benefit we learn from this beautiful phrase here is that and we learned this from the hadith as well never does Allah take something away from you and you are patient except that Allah will give you something better than what he has taken away never is some tragedy occurring to you never do you lose someone or something and you are patient except that Allah will substitute something or someone that is better for you just be patient and you will find something in your life it's not gonna fill the empty hole of that lost loved one that's a special place that's a special place in your heart but Allah will give you other good and other blessings that will be there for you because you were patient this is very explicit that Allah wanted to substitute and our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said whoever leaves something for the sake of Allah Allah will give him something better than what was taken away Allah will give him something better than what was taken away we learn from this as well the third instance we learn from the story is that there were uh, uh, there, there were two orphans their father had died and their father was a righteous man and he had left a treasure under this portion of his wall he had a wall at the end of the city poor man very end of the city is his house and he has a treasure he thought one day he'd tell his sons about it but he dies before his sons are old so the sons do not know so they live a very difficult life a very a life of hardship and Look at these people of the city. They did not give Musa and Khadr a glass of water. What do you think they would have done if they discovered a treasure for two little kids? What do you think they would have done? Would they have given it to the kids? They would have confiscated it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala delayed that discovery. Despite the fact that the, the mother of these children, put yourself in her situation. She must be wondering, my husband was a righteous man. Where is that piety now? Where is all of the good that we were supposed to have? She might be making dua to Allah constantly for rizq for sustenance and she does not realize because again we don't know and Allah knows that if that sustenance if that treasure were to be discovered today which she wants she doesn't want to delay 10 years she wants it right here and now but she doesn't know if she gets it now she's not gonna see any of it 
Plus, when do you really need wealth? When the kids are two or when they're 20? When do you really need wealth? When the young men are able to take the money, defend it, invest it, do something with it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected the piety of the dead father. And this shows us another point, brothers and sisters. You want to protect your children? You want to have your children to be righteous? You want to give them the best of the deen and the dunya? The way you do so is you start with yourself. By the way, even in the second story, their parents were righteous, so Allah wanted to give them a righteous kid. Who amongst us does not want a righteous son or daughter? Who amongst us does not want a loving, caring, generous, good human being as a son and daughter? Wallahi, we all do. How do we get that? And how do we give our children the best? We begin with ourselves. We begin with ourselves, our own akhlaq, our own manners, our own worship and relationship of Allah. وَكَانَ أَبُوهُمَا صَالِحًا Their father was a good man. That's what Allah says. So the money of the children was given to them because their father was a good man. You want to take care of your kids? You begin with your own piety. You want to give them the best of this world? Even before your job and career, you begin with your own inner spirituality. That is step number one. The point being, in this case we learn, sometimes you're afflicted with a tragedy, sometimes you're afflicted with a calamity, and you don't see the end in sight, but you don't understand. It is there for a reason, and that delay, even though you don't know, it is actually for a reason that you will maybe see later on. In all of these three stories, the one underlying current and theme is we must accept Allah's qadr and trust that it is the best for us because what Allah decides is always going to be what is best for us, whether we understand it or whether we do not understand it. And that is one of the biggest blessings of believing in Allah's qadr, in the iman of Allah's qadr, which is one of the fundamentals of our faith. May Allah subhanahu Subhanahu wa ta'ala bless me and you with and through the Quran and may he make us of those who his verses they understand and applies halal and haram throughout our lifespan. I ask Allah's forgiveness. You as well ask him for his the ghafoor and the Rahman. Alhamdulillah al wahid al ahad al samad al ladhi lam yalid wa lam yulad wa lam yakul lahu kufu an ahad wa ba'du. Dear Muslims, on the international scene, as usual, so much is going on. Where does one even begin? We see what is happening. Of course, the long list of the past, the Uyghur situation, Muslims of Burma, Palestine, currently what is happening in India, and now we see the invasions of Ukraine and whatnot. In today's brief half khutbah, second khutbah, I want to remind myself and, and all of you of one of the things I have been saying consistently. One of the, one of the, not the only and not number one, but one of the things that we should be cognizant and aware of is the fact that Allah has blessed us to be living in this land. This is a land that has a lot of power. It is the land that is the number one superpower in the world. And Allah has blessed us to be citizens of this land. We have safety and security, and we have the power to influence our local politics and politicians. I have said this many times. I don't believe this is the number one tactic, but it's also not something we should ignore. Yes, we begin with ourselves. Yes. Taqwa and spirituality is number one. But one of the tools, one of the tactics, one of the means is to see who it is that is in power and who it is that is in the best interest of humanity, in the best interest of peace, in the best interest of our own civic lives. Brothers and sisters, participating in the political process of this land is really something that is a no-brainer, especially after the last 25 years have shown us what happens when we are apolitical. We cannot allow politicians who have nothing to do with us to dictate unto us how to live our lives. If you're not going to participate in the political process, that in and of itself is a type of participation. And whether you like it or not, even if you don't participate, automatically other people will be and your lack of participation will be its own influence. This is a part and parcel of the country that we live in. And we are currently seeing the, uh, the, this is currently the week of voting and next week is going on. And 
especially epic alhamdulillah we're going to be having polling stations for the first time this is the first time we're going to have polling stations in our own masjid now by the way when we have a polling station in our own vicinity and masjid politicians can monitor and track the votes they're not going to see your name or whatnot but they'll see that this community predominantly voted in this manner predominantly voted for that candidate what this shows is that they will see that we have a block vote they will see that our own community is not a community that can be ignored in the, the, the cities that we're in and in the districts that we're in there are tens of thousands of people like us tens of thousands we have the potential to influence at the electoral level we have the potential to influence and this week is the week of the primaries this is even more important that we get involved why because the primaries is when the candidates are selected and for whatever reason in this country primaries hardly anybody goes to 10% of the people go to so so if large groups go to the primaries, you can actually influence more than later on. So this is the week of the primaries. I cannot tell you who to vote for. That's not something we're allowed to do. That's your job. Choose the lesser of the two evils. Choose the one who will look at what is going on in the world. Choose the one who will at least give statements against the Uyghurs, against what is happening in India. Because in reality, let us not underestimate the PR that those countries want. You do not know if a senator, if a congressman releases a statement, it might might affect policy at the national level and not just this our politics isn't just foreign we're also concerned about what's going on here our jobs our health care our education it's our job to be educated who is running for our districts who are the people that are going to be ruling over us whether you like it or not your taxes and mine are their salary these are our representatives so the least that we should do is to do our homework to do our research and there are organizations Muslim and otherwise that are doing this work for you if you don't know ask around but the least we should be do is to be aware and then make a conscious decision even if you choose not to and I'm not saying you must even if you choose not to do so based upon knowledge based upon your understanding that all of these people in your opinion are you know not worth your, your support that's your decision that's up to you but the very least be aware and influence and petition and call and do you know what brothers and sisters as our numbers and quantities increase and as our political participation increases Increases. It's only a matter of time before the very people that are supposed to rule over us are going to get our feedback. There are communities just as small as ours, but they are politically powerful. No person runs for office except that they meet with those communities. They get the approval from those communities. They see what is what is this community is interested in for whatever reason. We Muslims of America haven't gotten to that level yet, even though we have the numbers and we have the wealth. Wallahi, we have the numbers and we have the wealth. But because we are apolitical by and large, and because we're recent groups of immigrants, this is going to take a while. But the change has to be from now. We can influence our local politics, our foreign politics, our domestic politics. But in order to do so, we need to be actively involved. So my ask of you is very simple. Do your research. Do your homework. Know who's running and what are their stances. If you don't know, give them a call. Give them uh, uh, your shout out if you agree or your disagreement. Make sure they know who you are. And slowly but surely, every one of us can make a difference. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for tawfiq and ikhlas and hidayah. Allahumma ni da'in fa aminu. Allahumma la ta'in fi hadhi yawmi dhamban illa ghafarta. Wa la hamman illa farrajta. Wa la daynan illa qadayta. Wa la maridan illa shafayta. Wa la asiran illa yassarta. Allahumma gfir lana wa li إخواننا الذين سبقونا بالإيمان ولا تجعل في قلوبنا غلا للذين آمنوا ربنا إنك رؤوف رحيم اللهم أعز الإسلام والمسلمين اللهم من أرادنا أو أراد الإسلام والمسلمين بسوء فاشغله من نفسه وجعل تدميره في تدبيره يا قوي يا عزيز عباد الله إن الله تعالى أمركم بأمر بدأ به بنفسه وثنى بملائكة قدسه وثلث بكم أيها المؤنون من جنه وإنسه فقال عز من قائل عليما إن الله وملائكة يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل وسلم وبارك وأنعم على عبدك ورسولك محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين عباد الله إن الله تعالى يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعيدكم لعلكم تذكرون أذكروا الله العظيم يذكركم واشكروه يزد لكم ولذكر الله تعالى أكبر وأقم الصلاة There is a janaza after the prayer, so please remain and we'll pray Salatul Janaza, inshallah.
الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح قد قامت الصلاة قد قامت الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله استو straight new rose you know gaps on the line الله أكبر الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين الله نور السماوات والأرض مثل نوره كمشكات فيها مصباح المصباح في زجاجة الزجاجة كأنها كوكب دري يوقد من شجرة مباركة يوقد من شجرة مباركة زيتونة لا شرقية ولا غربية يكاد زيتها يضيء ولو لم تمسسه نار نور على نور يهدي الله لنوره من يشاء ويضرب الله الأمثال للناس والله بكل شيء عليم الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين في بيوت أذن الله أن ترفع ويذكر فيها اسمه يسبح له فيها يسبح له فيها بالغدو والآصال رجال رجال لا تلهيهم تجارة ولا بيع عن ذكر الله وإقام الصلاة وإيتاء الزكاة يخافون يوما تتقلب فيه القلوب والأبصار ليجزيهم الله أحسن ما عملوا ويزيدهم من فضله والله يرزق من يشاء بغير حساب الله أكبر
سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم we have a number of requests for dua before the janaza uh, so we have brother Dr. Muhammad Al Khawaja uh, who has pancreatic cancer, terminal, and we also have our brother Muzaffar Sayyid who has cancer. The both of them are members of our community. They've, they've asked us to make dua. Allahumma shfiim shifan aajil la yuqadur al-saqma. Allahumma rabb al-nasi adhib al-basi anta al-shafi. La shifa ila shifa wa kishfa la yuqadur al-saqma. We also have um, brother, or sorry, sister, uh, Siti Sabina. Uh, who has passed away in India and uh, her daughter is our community member Inna lillahi wa rajiun. We ask Allah Azza wa to forgive her, to grant her firdaus, to make her place of grave a vast place We ask her to give thabat in the time of the, the questions We ask Allah Azza wa to give sabr to their family members insha'Allah So, the family member of Sister uh, Fatima, who wants to lead the janazah, they come here, inshallah. Who wants to lead the janazah? Okay, inshallah. Uh, alaykum. So the family member will lead the janazah. It's uh, four takbirat. The first takbirah is going to be Surah Al-Fatiha. Second takbirah will be Salah Ibrahimiyya. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. The third takbirah we make dua for the deceased. Allahumma fillaha warhamha. If you know the dua, that's fine. If not, then you can just say, Oh Allah, forgive her. Allahumma fillaha. The fourth time you can say, Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana. And then you have the taslim, inshaAllah. It's like... Uh, we make dua for ourselves after the third, you know, we make the, yeah. The deceased name is Fatima, Ahmed Qasim. Jazakum Allah khair. Allahu Akbar. الله أكبر الله أكبر
الله أكبر السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله إن المسلمين والمسلمات والمؤمنين والمؤمنات والقانتين والقانتات والصادقين والصادقات والصابرين والصابرات والخاشعين والخاشعات والخاشعين والخاشعات والمتصدقين والمتصدقات والصائمين والصائمات والحافظين فروجهم والحافظات والذاكرين الله كثيرا والذاكرات أعد الله لهم مغفرة وأجرا عظيما